Yes, Mr. Hodge. Commissioner, the next witness is Brendan Stanford. I call Mr. Stanford. Yes. You go into the witness box, Mr. Stanford, and can I ask you whether you would prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? I have an oath. Thanks, Commissioner. Yes. You swear the witness, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence that I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Do sit down. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Your name is Brendan John Stanford. That's correct. And you reside in an address that you've given to the Royal Commission. That's correct. And do you currently work as a hospitality contractor? Uh, I. Yeah, I am. I'm a hospitality contractor. I've been off work for a period of time, though, just with illness, but um, that's my known job. All right. And you received a summons to attend to give evidence before the Royal Commission? That's correct. Do you have a copy of that, or do you have that summons there? I do. Thank you. I tend to the summons, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.105 will be the summons. And Mr Stanford, you've made a statement for the Royal Commission dated the 24th of May 2018. I have. And you've read through that statement? I have. And is, are the contents of the statement true and correct? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Thank you. I tend to the statement, Commissioner, exhibit together with the exhibits. Exhibit 3.106 will be the statement and exhibits of Mr Stanford. Okay. Now, Mr Stanford, I want to just take you through a series of events. We're going to start before the relevant hotel and begin in 2005. In 2005, you and your brother were working as the owners and licensees of a pub, is that right? That's correct. And where was the pub? Um, in the Hunter Valley, New South Wales. Right. And were you own it, did you own it together? No, I owned it uh, in partnership with my wife at the time. And what was your brother's role in it? He was manager, basically, general manager. And how long had you held the pub for? Uh, since 2001. All right. And before you'd bought the pub, you'd been working as an officer of the Australian Federal Police? That's correct. And how long had you been a since AFP officer for? 1991. All right. And then once you bought the pub, were you working in the pub? The Cessnock pub? Yes, yes. All right. And your brother was also working in the pub from some point in time? He, he joined um, me at the hotel in early 2003. Okay. And what had, what had he been doing before he came to the pub? He worked with the CSIRO down here in Melbourne. And was the pub profitable? Very. All right. But you sold it? Sold it, yes. And why did you want to sell it? Um, at that time, I thought we'd been there long, long enough. It's, um, it's a very full-on commitment, seven days a week and not many days off, long hours, running basically, uh, you know, a hands-on operation. Um, yeah, four to five years, I think, um, would bring just about anyone unstuck if, unless you step back and just take a, you know, an overseeing role. But um, I was very hands-on with what happened and I thought it was time for a, a break and to move on. And after you sold that pub, were you looking to buy another pub? Not immediately, no. All right. But you did eventually buy another pub? I did. And how did that come about? Um, we just sort of always had a look in the marketplace to see what was around. We sort of had a, a bit of criteria about how far we wanted to be from the major centres, doesn't matter where it was, um, what major centre, but um, just, you know, with uh, good industry around, um, so unemployment, possibly a, a growth area as well. So just the normal sort of due diligence you'd look at to know that um, the area was going to sustain um, you going into business and it would be profitable in the long run. And when you say we, does that mean you and your brother? Absolutely, yeah. All right. And... Eventually, you found the Coronation Hotel in Portland? That's correct. And how did you become aware of that hotel? Oh, I just saw it advertised. We'd looked at a number of others, but um, we saw this advertised. Um, it seemed to be a, a good performer on 
uh, on the figures that we saw initially. We did our, you know, we visited the hotel at different times as well, and um, understood, understand what um, they were doing there, and you know, just to make sure that um, the trade that was happening was backed up by the figures that they were displaying. When you say the figures they were displaying, you were provided with access to the books for the pub. Yeah, the broker gives you. Um, um, you know, a certain snapshot of what's actually going on. And was it a profitable business? It seemingly was a profitable business. All right. And you ended up buying the hotel, is that right? We did. All right. And that was in 2006? That's correct. And who were the buyers of the hotel? Um, myself and my brother. All right. So you, as individuals, you bought it? Uh, yeah, the land and building, like uh, we set it up, um, a company to run the business and land and buildings as a partnership. The two of you who owned it? That's correct. And did you need a loan to buy it? We did. How much was the purchase price, can you recall? Uh, it was They were asking 1.75 and we negotiated 1.6 million. All right. And you applied for a loan from Bank West? That's correct. And... How much did you apply for from Bank West? Uh, we applied for 1.2 million, which was their, uh, the maximum LVR, I think, that they were sort of offering at that stage. So, And how did you fund the difference? Uh, personal savings or uh, own cash. <coughs> and Bank West gave you a loan over the property? That's correct. And was there a valuation that was done of the property? There was a valuation done. And who prepared the valuation? Um, uh, Robertson and Robertson, a panel valuers for the bank. And what was it valued at? At 1.6 million. The price you were paying for it? That's correct. And Bankwest offered to lend you the $1.2 million? That's correct. And can you recall what the security was that you provided for the loan? The, the hotel, basically. And do you remember whether there was also some security granted by the company that was going to run the business? Uh, yes, it was. The company provided security as well. All right. And was the company called Let It Rain Proprietary Limited? That's correct. All right. And, but the business loan itself was taken out in you and your brother's names. That's correct. And just so the commissioners can get some sense of the structure of the business, what was the reason for incorporating Let It Rain? Oh, it's just um, over time, uh, if you ever want to lease the business, that was just a structure that seemed to work where you could um, own the freehold and actually a new entity could come in over the top as a, a, a lessee. Um, should you want to go that way? It's just a, a, a general structure that um, sort of worked with hotels and um, it was a long-term sort of strategy for us to, with the hotel, we, we, were, we were going to be there for a long term. And how long was the loan for? Uh, 20 years. And was it a interest-only loan? Uh, no. What were the nature of the payments you were making? Uh, well, it's principal and interest. And do you recall at some point in time your loan was split into a fixed interest and variable interest part? Yeah, I do. That was possibly not, not too long after we'd um, gone into the hotel, maybe 2007, 2008. All right. And the company in Ru Let It Rain, which is running the business, were you a director of the company? No, I wasn't. Were you a shareholder of the yeah, company? Yeah, I was a shareholder. And after you bought the pub, who was operating it on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, for the first 15, 16 months, uh, we both did. Um, well, we set everything up and our structures and um, internal and training and everything else and understood what, um, how the business had functioned. Um, yeah, so basically I was there till the end of 2007 and um, my brother assumed um, responsibility of running the pub after that. Okay. And you went to work in another job, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Right. 
And when you started operating the business, how was it? How was it running? How was it performing? Um, virtually in line with, with the figures that we were provided. Um, I noticed that in the first 12 months, we'd sort of turnover had been up around 10% on what we'd initially seen, so positive. All right. Now, over time, the performance dipped off? Yeah, not, not in the first number of years. I think around the um, first half of F, uh, financial year 11, so towards the end of 2010, that's when it was a bit noticeable that um, but um, you know there's a lot of other factors in the marketplace that were um, causing concern and um, yeah I don't think it was an unusual set of circumstances to see a downturn. And at that stage late 2010 early 2011 what was your brother's role in the business? Yeah he was still running the business as a manager and what was your role in the business by that um, stage? I just helped out and whatever. So I, I actually um, had a job in Bathurst from 2010. So I sort of travelled in between the hotel and Bathurst and where I was um, living at the time. And um, I just, you know, we spoke virtually daily about how things were going and what we needed to do. And I just helped out where I could. So whatever was required, I'd, I'd just pitch in. Who was responsible for the financial accounts of the business? Um, overall, Michael was because he was there the whole time. But yeah, as I said, when I came in, I'd just look at where things are at and what creditors needed paying and we just talked about what we're going to do and how we're going to arrange the you know, turnover for the week and just the normal discussions you'd have around finances as in any business. And did the business have accountants? Uh, we did, yes. Throughout the whole period? Yes. All right. I think at some point you changed accountants, is that right? Yeah, we did after... Um, uh, in 2011. All right. We'll come to that in a moment. So the licensee of the hotel throughout this time was who? My brother, Michael. OK. And in 2009, Bankwest asked for the hotel to be revalued? That's correct. And that was consistent with what was required under the loan, which yeah, is evaluation every three years? Three years, yeah, that's correct. And did you arrange for evaluation to be done? Uh, we uh, spoke to the, the, the valuer and arranged, you know, a rate and then that time in a period, like we had to make sure that they can do it. Um, but um, Bankwest uh, commissioned the valuation. All right. And did you see that valuation at the time? Yes, I did. And can you recall... We don't need to guess, we'll bring it up. It's CBA.0001.0285.0567. CBA.0001.0285.0567. It's Exhibit 2 to Mr Stanford's statement. So this is the valuation dated the 30th of October 2009? Yes. That's right? Mr. Yes. And you see it's instructed by Mr Gary Goldsmith. He was the relationship manager that you were dealing with at the time from Bankwest? That's correct. And... If we go to the page dot zero five seven one, you see the valuation as at thirty October two thousand and nine was one point five five million dollars. Yes, and you understand that one of the ways in which the business is valued is by capitalising the maintainable net profit of the business. I do. And so as the profit falls, depending on what the capitalisation rate for, does, you would expect that the value of the whole enterprise would fall? Depending on market conditions, yes. All right. And...
you, you <coughs> referred to what then happened in 2010 in terms of trading and you said it, there was a decrease in performance of the business? Yeah, I towards I think the end of the December half of 2010, um, I, I, you know, it was a fairly common knowledge that the, the flow on effects for the GFC, I think that also there was the, the smoking changes in hotels had, had sort of run its full course. Um, and so there was changes as far as um, uh, that you couldn't smoke in the venues as well. Um, so, yeah, there was plenty happening, happening um, you know, in the industry as far as, you know, reasons for, for a downturn in trade, I'd say. And in 2010, do you know whether the business or whether you and your brother were maintaining your principal and interest payments? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, yes. But one thing that did happen was that you, or at least Let It Rain, fell behind on commitments to the ATO. That's correct. And are you aware of what was done to try to redress that? Um, yeah, we contacted the ATO and just um, formalised a payment plan to rectify that shortfall. And do you know whether you made payments in accordance with the payment plan? Uh, I, yeah, I believe so. Now... Do you recall that the business applied for an overdraft facility? Yes, I do. And can you remember what the reason for that was? Um, around the same time, we... Sorry, just around the same time, you mean in 2010? Yeah, right? sorry, in 2010, yeah. We, we always um, operated like on a continuous improvement for the hotel. Like, they're old establishments. There's always things you can, you know, you can do to keep the look and the feel of the place in the way it was. We had uh, shops associated with it as well, so letable um, businesses that... Um, uh, four shops that were um, part of the premises. And so we spent money on doing them up so we could have tenants in them. Uh, we set up a function room. We had um, a separate um, entrance to the, uh, to the function room through the hotel we actually put holes in the walls and a uh, walkway through so we could have um, separate space to have bigger events um, we increased the floor size in the hotel as well we took out an airlock and uh, just so it was just a like i said a continual sort of arrangement that we had um, plus the fact that things had sort of there was an identified slowing down um, we just didn't want to be caught in a place where you know, you sort of, you couldn't meet your commitments. And do you know how much the overdraft was for? $20,000. Okay. And that was something you sought then in 2010, is that right? Yeah. Well, we'd, we'd actually asked previously to go interest only for, for a period, but um, that wasn't an option as explained by our relationship manager. Okay. And... You were, though, given the $20,000 overdraft? We were. And in terms of the operation of that overdraft, at some point that became overdrawn. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And do you remember why that was? Um, not 100%. I, I, I'd, I'd only be speculating, but what, the way things work with Bank West, we didn't have a branch close by, so... Our closest branch was Orange. Um, so we'd have our FPOS system set up that our payments through FPOS went directly into that account, so we'd always had funds going in. So in line with the slowdown of the business in that period, there'd be less going into that account, um, and that's that'd be what I'd say is why it became overdrawn. Do you recall in 2010... A discussion with Mr Goldsmith about signing a new document or a new loan document? Yes, I do. All right, and can you tell us what you can remember about that? I, I remember I was obviously working in Bathurst at the time, as I mentioned, and we'd gone across and he'd arranged for a lunch to meet at one of the other establishments in, in Bathurst. And it was explained that um, the facility that we had was no longer available and um, 
it needed to change. Um, and we thought, oh, well, I thought that um, it sounded reasonable under, you know, the explanation from, from Mr Goldsmith. Can you remember what changes you understood would happen as a result of the new document? The only thing that really stands out to me was the fact that our, our reporting would change. So where it was annually before, it would go to quarterly. And you knew that at the time you were signing the document? Yes, we did. That was basically explained by Mr Goldsmith to us. All right. Do you remember any change to your interest rate at about that time? I don't. Okay. And you signed the document to change the loan over? We did. All right. And that didn't change the term of the loans? Not, no, not to my knowledge. Okay. But it did introduce, as you understood it, this reporting covenant. That's correct. And that required you to provide quarterly reports. Quarterly reports. And do you know whether that obligation was being met after uh, the sign? In the first instance, no. I, I think it just it's one of those things that it, it takes a bit, you know, where you're providing your, your information to your accountant once a year. To, to do it quarterly, it's um, you know new systems have to be impl implemented, and um, that didn't happen straight away. So, do you recall that before you signed this document under the old loan agreement, that you had other reporting requirements you had to meet? Uh, we'd get a letter, I think, annually from um, our representative from Dubbo, and um, that sort of set out what we need to do. So, that's as simple as it was. And do you recall there was sometimes some difficulty in meeting those annual obligations? Yeah, well, it's a very busy time of the year for accountants, so a lot of the time we, you know, rely on, you know, their peaks and troughs as far as things go. So we can we can ask for it as quickly as we can, but sometimes it just doesn't come. And after the new loan agreement was made with the quarterly obligation, quarterly reporting obligations, I think you've explained you you had an issue or you weren't always meeting those obligations is yes that, right? that happened in the first instance and in fact you didn't manage to provide it on time the very first time it was due after you signed the agreement yes that's correct and you received a a letter from the bank yes we did and perhaps if we just bring up one of those, exhibit 3 CBA.0001.0285.1231. Sorry, 1231, not 1281. <coughs> CBA.0001.0285.1231. So this is the first notification of breach you received after, that's what after having failed to yes. provide the quarterly reports, and that's on the 30th of November 2010? That's correct. Now, it says that there's a breach fee of $250, but also that that's waived in this instance. Is that right? That's what it says, yes. And you don't remember having been charged $250? No, I don't. Okay. Was this, or do you remember receiving this letter at the time? Not, not personally, not, not exactly that I can say that. I, I know that it was a discussion around the breaches and, but um, not exactly receiving that letter. Do you recall your brother talking to you about what dealings he was having with Bankwest? Yes. All right. Do you recall 
what he had said to you about what he understood Bankwest's attitude to be to the business? At the time, I, there was nothing that would have given any other indication that it was business as usual. <coughs> Even when we transferred from Dubbo to Orange, that was the quote from our relationship manager, our business manager from Dubbo was, it's going to be business as usual once, it, once your account goes across to Orange. Right. Can you recall at some stage Michael, I'm sorry, your brother Michael becoming suspicious about whether the Bankwest wanted to sell the business? Um, from the outset, when we had the meeting in, in Bathurst, he's said to me a number of times over the years in relation to that meeting that he wasn't comfortable with how things transpired that day, um, with the meeting with Gary Goldsmith. Um, but, um, so there was suspicions obviously there. From him, you mean? From no, him. But not from you? No. Okay. And the meeting in Bathurst, do you remember what year that was? Uh, in 2010. Okay. Now, there was then another type of breach letter that you received. Can we bring up Exhibit 7, CBA.0001.0285.1278? So this is a letter received on the 8th of April 2011. Yeah. Can you recall receiving this at no, the time? No, I don't. Okay. You understand there are two types of breaches being identified here. One is failing to maintain an ICR ratio. The other is failing to maintain a DSR ratio. Yes. Do you understand what that means? Uh, yeah, I do. All right, so if we start with ICR, could you just explain what that means and what you're required to do? Well, it's the, it's basically um, your EBITDA divided by your interest. Um, and that's as, as my understanding, so. So your EBITDA has to be more than two times two, the More than two payment. times, yeah. And DSR, do you understand what that is? Um, no, not exactly. Okay. And do you recall what happened after this letter was received? No. Okay. Do you know whether by April of 2011, you and your brother were still making your principal and interest payments? No, I don't. Do you know whether you were still making your payments to the ATO? Yeah, uh, my assumption is yes, we would be, because we... Um, as, as far as I'm aware, we never folded from the, the, the payment schedule. All right. Do you remember whether, as at the beginning of 2011, you and your brother were contemplating selling the hotel? We, we'd had discussions in regards to it, um, similar to um, a previous hotel. I thought, you know, four to five years in in a place was a time for a break. You know, it's it's energy, it's focus, it's marketing, it's, you know, changing the way you're going to do things. Everything about it, you know, it needs to be invigorated again and you've got to work out whether you've got those energy levels or you can see enough blue sky to actually continue on, um, you know, in the, in the same vein. So we definitely had a discussion around it. And what did you decide to do? Um, Michael wanted to stay. He wanted to stay. He wanted to stay. Right. And I may have asked half of this question at the beginning of your examination, but you were borrowing money for 20 years. How did you foresee this investment in the pub turning out? In, as I stated before, it was a long-term play for me. As far as I was concerned, we'd get to a point where we could comfortably lease it out and use those funds to to pay off the rest of the facility that we had. Um, that was probably the ideal plan. Um, if the market was strong enough, again, you'd contemplate um, selling as well. It's very cyclical, like I've seen the ups and downs over, you know, 20 odd years with it. And you know that for every down, there's the ups as well. So it's just how you can deal with those downs. Now, you know that in 
the second half of 2011, Bankwest appointed PPB advisory to perform a function as investigative accountants. Yeah, prior to them turning up at the hotel, no, I didn't know that they'd... No, sorry, I, let me break it down. At the moment, you know now that they appointed somebody to go and be investigative accountants? Yes. And I think you were then talking about when you first found out that they'd appointed somebody to do that, is that right? Yeah. And when did you first find out that they'd appointed investigative accountants? Uh, when my brother rang me to tell me that um, they'd just showed up at the hotel. And what did you understand they were there to do? A report for the bank. On how the hotel was going? A report for the bank. And... There was no mention of a, an investigative report or anything of that nature. I see. You just knew that PPB advisory had turned up at the hotel, is yeah. that what you mean? And then were you subsequently told that they'd prepared a report? Not, not until we were made aware that um, down the track that there was a problem. Yes, but you know that at some point in time they told... They were preparing a report for the bank. Yes. Yes. After they'd gone away, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did they ever speak to you? No. And at that time then, the person who was responsible for managing the business though was your brother? That's correct. And what sort of role were you playing then in 2011? It's just similar to, to before. I'd, I'd be there every second week and we'd discuss, you know, where things were at, how we were tracking in regards to, you know, different ways we saw opportunity to increase revenue. As I said, we had, um, we are looking at, uh, we had change over in some of the tenants in the, um, uh, in our, uh, shops, shop fronts that we had. Um, we had uh, approaches from uh, a, a employment agency in Lithgow to, to utilise the space as well within our shops. We were doing a refurbishment of our accommodation rooms upstairs. So we, 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 after the, um, the financial 2011, we went a lot um, harder with entertainment and all that sort of stuff to bring people into the hotel. Um, so, you know, we had a, a fair few irons in the fire in, in trying to rectify the situation from the end of financial year 11. If you just go back to that point in time when your brother called you to tell you that PPB advisory were at the hotel, did the two of you have a discussion about what that meant, what the significance of that was? The suspicions, I guess, from Michael's point of view, were raised again in relation to what was going on with the bank. But there was no wording or anything that was said in that um, <coughs> scenario that would have raised a flag that there was an issue forthcoming. Now then, if we go to Exhibit 8 to your statement, which is CBA.0002.1973.7265. So this is a letter sent to you dated the 3rd of November 2011? That's correct. And it's from Gaydon's lawyers? That's correct. And they were the lawyers acting for Bankwest? Uh, yes. All right. You see it refers to our letter of the 15th of August 2011? Yes. You're not sure what that is? No. Okay. And it explains, we go over the page to dot seven two six six. At the top of the page that Bankwest has received an independent investigative accountant's report into the trading position of the hotel. Yes. And 
as a result of reviewing the report, Bankwest is concerned that a change has occurred in the business's financial condition? Yes. And you were required within seven days to say whether you were prepared to acknowledge that there had been a material adverse change in the financial condition of the hotel? Yes. And if you weren't prepared to do that, to outline the reasons why, in your opinion, there had not been a material adverse change and yes. provide financial records to support your position? Yes. Now, had you received a copy of the independent accountant's report? No, we haven't. Did you ever receive a copy of the independent accountant's report? No, I didn't receive a copy. Did you provide a response within seven days to explain why you disagreed with the report I, you hadn't seen? From memory, I don't believe there was seven days to actually provide a response. I think that um, by the time we received it, and it was just a couple of days, but um, we, um, as per the last line, took um, their advice to speak to um, a solicitor ourselves and we got them to draft a letter to um, in response to try and work out what was actually the basis of what was going on. All right, and before we come to what happened after this letter, you were also asked to pay the investigative accountant's fees of $9,900 within seven days? That's correct. Do you know whether you did that? Uh, I believe the charge was applied to our overdraft at some stage. Right. And you referred then to having sought legal advice after getting this letter? That's correct. Right. And if we then go to Exhibit 9, CBA.4000.0037.5293. This is a letter back to Gaydens from Lands Legal. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is Lands Legal your lawyers? Yes. Or they were your lawyers? Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And did they send this letter on your instructions? Yes, they did. And you'll see in the letter that they ask for a copy of the investigative accountant's report? That's correct. And also a copy of the tax invoice? That's right. And You've already said you didn't receive a copy of the report. Did you receive a copy of the tax invoice? No, we didn't. And can we then go to Exhibit 10, which is CBA.0002.1973.7271? So the other, the other letter that you received from Gaydens was about a termination of the overdraft account? Yes. And do you recall what happened with the overdraft account? Uh, to my knowledge, nothing. All right. It still existed and because uh, I said before our FPOS earnings kept going into the account and as I said, those, the charges uh, that Bank West had for the investigative report and also for guidance were applied to the, the same account as well. Now, at about this time, did you also make a complaint to the Financial Ombudsman Service? Uh, I believe so. And do you recall that you had contact with Bank West about trying to arrange a meeting? Yes. Was this at about this time in November of 2011? That's correct. And did the meeting go ahead? Yes, it did. And can you remember who attended the meeting? Uh, for our, um, for our, our side, there was um, uh, Andrew Wennerbaum from Lands Legal. There was um, representatives from our accountants to um, two parties there and my brother and myself and for Bank West there was 
uh, Matthew Maxwell as their representative. Um, there was a couple of people from Gaydens and a couple of people from PPB advisory as well. And do you remember what you were told at the meeting about Bankwest's intentions? Not. Uh, the discussion was a, basically we were trying to ascertain what the investigative report actually showed. And the, and the fact that we didn't receive um, any information around it, like it just cast a, a shadow over the whole transparency of what was going on. Um, so they highlighted the fact that there'd been a, a a, a downturn in trade, which was obviously highlighted at the end of the 2010 quarterly report. <coughs> but I don't see how else there was information available for them to um, come up with a, this situation that, um, that we found ourselves in. So basically, um, they identified there was an issue with the hotel and we identified that that all businesses go through the peaks and troughs and we should be allowed to continue to trade through this. Can you remember whether by this time you were still paying your principal and interest payments? To my best of my knowledge, we were. And you say in paragraph 31 of your statement that after the meeting you remember thinking that Bank West was going to sell you up. Yes. Can you just explain what you mean by that and why you thought that? Well, it was, it was fairly common in the industry um, that there was a number of receivership sales going on and Bankwest were um, formed part of that and we, we had some in the vicinity of us as well that was going through those situations. I had friends in finance that were talking about not just hospitality but agribusinesses as well um, and it just seemed like that we were easy targets in, in that relation to the fact that you know we're high, high asset businesses but we're low cash flow so at the end of the day you know we, we have um, on the back of you know things like poker machines which provide you know, a, a good capital value in your asset. Um, so, you know, if they were sold, they're going to re realise a decent um, price on the marketplace compared to some other businesses. So, and I just want to understand or help the Commissioner to understand that. Was it something that was said at the meeting that caused you to think you were going to be sold up or was it just your sense about the situation not to do with something that was specifically said to you? Yeah, well, the demeanour, well, the way that was portrayed by Matthew Maxwell, he, it was uh, sort of, I even frame it as arrogance that um, that we, you know, we, we were genuinely looking to what's going on in this situation and how we arrived at this point and what's the transparency or the proof and the communication about how we, why we were here. And um, <clears throat> he wasn't forthcoming in relation to anything that was a positive sort of way out, the fact that um, when we, I said that we should be allowed to trade through it, that um, that wasn't going to be an option that was on the table so, again, it's the way we received the communication back to us that made it difficult. Um, I vaguely recall that, you know, that they were trying to push the accountants for a value on the, on the property as well. Um, and because there was no sales, you know, at that time, because the market was um, fairly soft, um, even right back to when we received the second valuation, I think three out of the four hotels that they used as guides for the valuation were receiver sales. So in country hotels, there wasn't a, a vibrant market at that stage of things. So um, the fact that they said our hotel was only worth $250,000, we said that there was something else at play here. Why, how could you value that? And even more, we pressed for um, how, how you could come up with that sort of figure. After the meeting, did you and your brother talk about what you were going to do? Um, not that I can recall. We, we obviously would have, but um, I can't recall any 
discussions. It was it was a high anxiety type thing, like coming down out of it after it, because it was, you know, it wasn't a good feeling to um, be on someone else's turf and be told that um, your business is worth two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and we're not going to show you why. And do you remember? whether you were intending to keep trading or try to sell the business? Yeah, we decided, like, with, with that information, we thought that the, the relationship with the bank was at a point where I don't think it was recoverable. We, in the, lead, in the first number of years that we were with Bank West, um, we didn't have a lot of contact with our um, relationship manager. But by the same token, we we're aware of what was required and all that sort of thing. Basically, the communication in the sense that, you know, this is what the bank's thinking, this is how we see things in the future or this is how we can help you, you know, that collaborative type thing that you'd expect from a, having a relationship with um, someone that you've got a loan of $1.2 million or whatever it was at that stage you'd think they'd be a bit more involved, but there wasn't, it wasn't a two-way street. We had to press for, you know, the meeting ourselves and trying to get that information to understand, you know, what really was going on. And so if we just go back to what I want to understand in terms of what your intention was, yeah. after the meeting then, what was your intention in terms of, you obviously, there's at least two options. One is you keep trading, the other is you look to try to sell the business, there may be others. What did you want to try to do? We, we wanted to bring the reports into line to actually show that the, you know, that, that situation that happened for financial year 11 was only a, you know, a glitch in the, in the five years that we'd been there. Um, so we instructed the accountants to get the books up to date as quick as we, quick as we could. Um, and we were going to, you know, make a decision from then. But we needed, if we were going to sell anyway, we needed to have that information um, readily available. We also, you know, over time contacted um, a broker um, to um, market the hotel. We um, instructed our solicitor to arrange contracts for sale of the hotel. We'd done the inventories, done all the, the steps that you'd, you'd generally do to bring a hotel to market. And were those steps you were taking in 2012? Uh, that, that was, yeah, in 2012, those, some of those steps had, had happened. Now, one of the things that we need to put in context is in 2012, you stepped away from being involved in the business? Is That's that correct. Right? And that was because you were receiving treatment for leukaemia at the time. That's correct. And that treatment stopped at some point in time? Um, it, it basically, the follow-on from it didn't end until early into the 2013. Right. And do you recall that the complaint that you'd made to FOS lapsed? I do. And then at some point in time you sought to reopen the FOS complaint? Yeah, we, we had an issue in trying to get our figures um, done through the accountants um, because they were basically starting from scratch with everything. It was a continual information transfer and that type of thing and it took longer than I would have anticipated um, to create a set of accounts and that type of thing. From memory, I think it was still going into 2013. We were still waiting for these figures. So it just delayed everything and caused even more, you know, issue with us. Was it when you were able to again turn your attention to what was going on in the business that the FOS complaint was re-enlivened or are they independent? No, uh, it, it was, uh, from, from memory, it was in 2013 and I'd gone through uh, my treatment and recovery. Uh, also, you know, I, I tried to do what I could in the background, but I was housebound for a, a fair part of it, so I could only do what I could do in relation to most things. But once you had re-enlivened the FOS complaint, there was then a telephone conversation conciliation that FOS convened? Yes, that's correct. And 
Do you recall what the outcome of that was? Uh, that we'd have enough time, hopefully, to, to list the hotel and sell it by, I think, June 2014. It'd be 30 June 2014. That sounds like. fair, yes. And do you remember whether you tried to sell it going up to 30 June 2014? Yes. Oh, we got to the point where um, the market was still quite soft. There wasn't a lot of sales in the marketplace what the general consensus was when we spoke to brokers and that was that um, people didn't need to offer money for hotels because if they were distressed assets they were going to come on the market anyway so you know you you had trouble justifying your capitalization rates and that type of thing so uh, at the start of the exercise i think we had a paper valuation um, from the broker of around 1.2 million and as we got closer to that point in 2014, um, you know, we're looking at capitalisation rates of over 20%, which brought it down to in the 900s, which just made it um, a, a difficult type of scenario to, to sell. Do you know whether the performance of the business had continued to go down during this period? Look, I, I can't recall. I, do, I remember back to financial year 12, um, to the best of my knowledge and things were back to what they were. I think over that period of financial year 11, we had a dip of somewhere around 10%. Um, but back to financial year 12, it was back to what it was before. And I, you know, so I had confidence that we, you know, that things were, you know, on the mend as far as things went. It was still your brother though, who was managing it day to day? Yeah, that's correct. And so in the first half of 2014, when you were trying to sell it, and you were, this was when you were talking about a paper valuation of 1.2 million and then being told on a capitalisation rate of over 20%, it's only worth 900 something yeah. thousand dollars. I want to just make sure we can understand the way you were looking at it at that point. How much were you looking to try to get out of the sale or to achieve with the sale? We we really just wanted to pay back what we owed the bank. That was as simple as that. It was there was no other um, sort of outcome that we would have been comfortable with. Um, but yeah, you know the realization came fairly quick once we started looking. You know, seeing where the capitalization rates were actually sitting at that time. So we went from like fifteen percent from the previous valuation, which was you know three, four, <coughs> five, three or four years before to you know, 20% basically based on not a lot of sales. Um, <coughs> so that, that was the reality. And do you remember whether in the lead up to June 2014, your brother wanted to sell the hotel or not? I think that um, he'd had enough of what had gone on as well. So definitely he was... Um, he was happy to sell. That was that was our aim of the the exercise and going to Foz the second time. Well, when you say he'd had enough, had enough of what? Oh, the scenario that played out. It, it took it. It takes its toll. You think that you're going okay, and then this is thrown into your business, and you're trying to deal like you're you're uh, you're little battlers in a in a small country pub and you can't turn things that quickly you have to work towards increasing turnover and that it doesn't just happen over a short period of time it takes you know 12 months to to realize some things to put plans into action and actually get some traction and and move forward with it so um to see all that work that you've done over you know an extended period just have a rug sort of pulled out from under you um i think it affected him more in that sense than me, even though I was going through, you know, a different set of circumstances myself. And as it got to the end of June 2014, you obviously hadn't managed to get a contract on the hotel? Um, yeah, well, we had everything ready to go, but we realised we were just going to waste our time. When you say you had everything ready to go, you, you didn't have a buyer who was willing to pay no, no, what no, you wanted? but we had everything in play that we required to do it so we had a marketing campaign we had our like through our broker and all that sort of stuff we had our figures done we had um, uh, a contract done inventory done so we're at that point where you could press a button and move forward in that sense 
And do you remember giving instructions to your accountant to make an offer to the bank? Uh, yes, that, so we changed back to our original accountants. So that was um, our original accountants in Dubbo. Uh, and they took up the charge to um, assist us in trying to uh, come up with a separate resolution. And if we bring up CBA.0001.0315.6409, So Michael Medway is your accountant, is that right? That's correct. And the email address has been entirely blocked out, but the Allison is <coughs> the person at Bank West that you'd been dealing with? Yes. And if we go to the bottom third of the email, and blow that up from the words in light of our position. So the offer that you were making was that you pay $200,000 to the bank by the following Friday, that's the first part. Is that right? Yes. And then the second part was a further $100,000 to be deposited 30 days after that. Yes. And that was to reduce the principal that was owing? That's correct. And it says there the money's coming from, that's your brother, is that right? Your brother's partner? That's right, yeah. And she was going to put up the money in order to reduce the principal debt, is that yeah, right? She felt strongly enough to do that, that um, the business was viable. And then the, what was requested was that the remainder be refinanced over 15 years. That's correct. And if we go over the page to dot 6410, and then blow up the paragraph in the middle of the page beginning I'm sorry, the two paragraphs beginning the brothers and then the second paragraph. And so one of the things that your accountant was trying to explain was that you thought there'd been some improvement in the performance of the business. Yes. And in terms of what was thought about as a strategy, if we then bring down that pop-up and pop up the next part, you'll see what was then being proposed was to try to improve the financial results and then sell it off over three to five years, is that right? That's correct. Now, do you recall I'm sorry, I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.107, uh, email Midway to Bank West, 26 June 14, CBA 0001 0315, uh, 0409, is it, Mr. Uh, 6409. 6409. Thank you. Thank you. And then you received a response to that email the next day? Or I'll just show it to you. CBA.0517.0118.0001. I think we need numbers again.
with the SIFs if I said it again, CBA.0517.0118.3000. <coughs> so this is the response that you received back from Bankwest the next day? Yes. Where the bank said it was unable to accept your proposal? Yes. And noted that it had already provided numerous concessions to you and your brother? That's correct. And pointed out that pursuant to the agreement you'd entered into on the 30th of January, you'd agreed to sell the hotel by auction by 30 June 2014? That's correct. And attached a copy of the signed agreement? I assume that's what was attached. Oh, we well, can see. Yeah, I can see the attachments there. That's right. And then reserved the bank's rights. Yes. And then said that she would be on leave for the next few weeks, so please contact somebody else at the bank if you had any further queries. Yes. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Email Bankwest, between Bankwest, Medway and Stanford and others, 27 June 14, CBA 0517-0118. Treble zero one, exhibit three point one oh eight. Did you sell the hotel by the thirtieth of June two thousand and fourteen? No, we didn't. And after that date passed, did you make a further offer to the bank? Uh, yes we did. And can we bring up RCD dot zero zero two four dot double zero one five dot triple zero one? And this is the chain of emails, I think, being forwarded on to you by your accountant, is that right? Yes. Mr. Medway is your accountant? That's correct. And if we go to the page beginning loan agreement, triple zero two, and can we bring that page up together with the page which is dot triple zero three? So a, you can see the date of this email from Mr. Medway to Mr. Hornstra at Bank West, which is the 1st of July, 2014. Can you make that out down in the bottom half of the yes, first page? Yes, yeah, I can see. And then it sets out what had been sent in the previous email to the other person from Bank West. Yes. And then if you go then to the bottom of the page ending dot zero 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 three, you'll see that a further offer was made and it explains that you'd managed to se secure outside monies of $400,000. That's correct. Can you recall where you'd secured those monies from? That was my brother's partner again. And Again, this was seeking as a first option to try to pay down the capital by $400,000 and then refinance the balance. That's correct. And the response from Mr. Hornstra, which is at the top of page dot triple zero two, was in short, we will not engage in a further banking relationship and simply require to be repaid. Yes. Should you, however, wish to repay $400,000 before 4 July 2014, mm. the bank may consider a period of eight weeks to allow you to seek refinance with the full residual debt being cleared at the end of that period? Yes. And... I tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, emails between Bankwest Midway and others to July 14, RCD 0024 0015 0001, Exhibit 3.109. You, I take it, didn't pay the $400,000 in order to be able to have an extra eight weeks no. to refinance with somebody else? No, we didn't. And what did the bank then do? Oh, I think it was not long after um, 
PPB turned up to the hotel again and closed it. They had been appointed as the receivers, is that right? That's correct. All right. And they sold the property? Uh, yes, I understand they did. Do you know what they sold it for? I didn't until uh, well after the event. Right. What do you understand they sold it for? I think it was 525000 in including stock. And they haven't pursued, Bankwest hasn't pursued you though for the balance of the debt that you and your brother owe? No. And are you able to explain to the commissioner what what was the effect on your brother of the selling of the hotel? Got to take a break? Just a short one, thank you. Yeah, I'll come back at uh, shortly before quarter past three. Yes, Mr. Hodge. I just have a few more questions. I'm just going to ask you again the question. I asked you just before the break, what was the effect on your brother of the um, sale of the hotel? Yes, um, basically, I think from the time this was instigated, I saw him struggle and, and even after it all happened, I, th I saw him depressed for, you know, for a few years. That's why I'm here today because he couldn't couldn't come in. Now you made a public submission I to did. the commission. I did. And and that was how the commission contacted you after sure, the public that's submission. Correct. And you've already explained why you made the submission. I did. I just want to ask you one other thing which is about the offers that you made at the very end. And what I wanted to suggest to you is that one potential issue for you if these offers had been accepted was that if the business performance had gone down rather than up, then the consequence might have been that your brother's partner would have lost the substantial amount of money that she was investing in the business. That's true. She, she felt strongly in it, enough about it, like she voiced her concerns that um, that she thought the business was viable, there was opportunity around the area. She worked locally. She was there the whole time. So she had just as good overview as anyone on the opportunity within the within the region. Um, she's she wouldn't have made that commitment unless she thought it was a, a viable option. I understand that, and what I just want to suggest though is it's possible. One possible outcome of that offer having been accepted by the bank is that you and your brother and your partners would end up, could have ended up being worse off than what ended up with the, in the situation that you were. That is a possibility. We, three of us were working elsewhere full time <coughs> um, in good, good and gainful employment. You know, there was other options that you know, should that sort of happen that, you know, we could have been in a different position as well. So I wouldn't say that's categorical. I don't have any further questions. Commissioner. Yes, thank you. Mr. Sherry. There's no cross-examination, Commissioner. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Stanford. You may step down. You are excused further attendance. <laughs>